Um, Kelly Hurst will now give an elegy, a eulogy. <laughs> We met in 2005, and by 2010, our friendship had deepened. And sometime in 2013, uh, we began to text one another daily, and that basically turned into me texting Heather morning pictures of my hair <laughs> when I woke up, um, which was just a rat's nest. And um, that made her laugh, and I just liked to make her laugh. And I need Pete to delete those off of the phone now. <laughs> so we're going to cry today. And we're probably going to laugh. And I just want to tell you the thing that I've learned about crying is that I just no longer apologize for it. It is just another emotion. And I never apologize for laughing either. Sometime late last night, this poem came to me. I've read so many times before, and I've sort of been looking for one. It's called A Blessing to the Brokenhearted, and the reason that it came to me is because I'm always looking for those words that always seem to fail us at times like this when we trip over them and don't know what to say and we say the wrong things. Blessing for the Brokenhearted. Let us agree for now that we will not say the breaking makes us stronger or that it is better to have this pain than to have done without this love. Let us promise that we will not tell ourselves time will heal the wound when every day our waking opens it again. Perhaps for now, it will be enough to simply marvel at the mystery of how a heart so broken can go on beating as if we were made precisely for this. As if it knows the only cure for love is more of it. As if it sees the heart's sole remedy for breaking is to love still. As if it trusts that its own persistent pulse is the rhythm of a blessing we cannot begin to fathom, but will save us nonetheless. Some of you may know that last year my son, Morgan, died in a car accident, and Heather came to stay with me for a whole week. She just planted herself in my house. That is a very intimate thing to do for someone. My husband had started a new job the week after, and he knew I was going to be home alone, and she did too she did not want me to be alone. So she cried with me, and she held my head in her lap. And she knew I needed her. Uh, she took me for walks like she did Coco and Chuck. Um, she put me on a walking schedule, basically. She watered me like her house plants. She painted my nails and read to me, and she took photographs of my granddaughters. And in the moments when that grief became unbearable, she just sat in silence with me. That's when I realized that when it is so very dark, you need somebody who's the light. She did that for me when I needed her the most, and so that's why I'm here doing this today. I'm just going to stand here as one witness in a room full of witnesses 
for the enormous giant loss of heaven, the living this world. She was this larger than life woman who possessed that incredible talent for writing gorgeous sentences, an incisive wit, that storyteller. <clears throat> if you ever received anything from Heather in the mail from Amazon, <clears throat> she used the F word so many times in that note, she was basically daring the employees to censor her. Either they did not know that they could censor her, or they were very entertained by her trying. And I have saved every single one of those hilariously foul mouth notes. And sometimes I will try to read them aloud and do an impersonation of Heather overemphasizing her accent and marveling at her use of adjectives and interjections, but I can't get it right. I will never get it right. But I want to tell you about the most amazing part of my friend, and it was her sense of wonder. She hung on to some words that I would long forget about, and I would say a word that she held on to a long, long time, and that one of those words was humanity. She asked me why I did the work that I do, and I said, because my humanity depends upon it. And that my humanity needs to reach out to other people's humanity, because that's what we're here for. She wanted to see humanity differently, and that became a topic of lots of our conversations. So when we grieve collectively as humans, this is a part of that. That part of what she wanted to see and do and be human came out when she came to my wedding. We were sitting in the backyard. I live in the Midwest. And all of a sudden, while we were just sitting there the night before the wedding, Heather saw something in the middle of the night and just went bonkers over it. It is the fireflies. I will always remember the fireflies. And we call them lightning sometimes. When she caught fight, or she caught sight of that first one, she said, what was that? Is that what I think it is? And she was giddy, but I do not use the word giddy to describe grown women very often, and she was giddy. There's another one. And with that, she was off. All long legs and gangly arms running through my yard with this quickly changing orange and red rust-colored sunset grass in what T.S. Eliot would call the violet hour. At the violet hour, the evening hour that strives homeward and brings the sailor home from sea, the typist home at tea time clears her breakfast lights, her stove, and lays out food and tends the wasteland, T.S. Eliot. She chased fireflies all over my yard, like she was five. She kept holding them really gently, and my husband and all of my Midwestern friends could not stop laughing at her. Do y'all not have fireflies here in Utah? <laughs> what? <laughs> it all makes sense. <laughs> she was enamored. I don't know what it was about it, but she just kept holding them in her hand, and then letting them go, and she was whispering to them and talking to them. <clears throat> I didn't know if she was whispering because she didn't want to scare them or if she thought she was going to wake them up. They don't really sleep, y'all, just so you know. Um, but she just kept laughing at them, and she was just in wonder and in awe, and she was saying to them over and over again and to all of us, these are amazing. Do you know how amazing these are? These are amazing. These fireflies are amazing. Oh my God, you get these every summer? Oh my God, you are so lucky. I just, I just wanted to hug her because it was so simple and it was so heather. She was really innocent about it and it was this real and truthful connection to the earth and to bugs. After her death, I found these words that she wrote to me. All the 
love and flowers and worship of the earth, it is all around us. And it is the most joyous burning fire of magic and power that you must witness. It cannot be put into words. There is meaning in everything we say and do and experience. Trust me when I say this, there are no coincidences. We come looking for each other, and if we are paying attention, we can hear it. The vibrant hour takes us from exertion to relaxation. She searched for relaxation for a really long time. She was an unexpected friend for me, and she was made of burning flames and magic and fireflies, and light. She was my silly, intuitive, and hilarious, and vulnerable, and alive, and tender, empathic, anguished, generous friend. And she has transitioned from day into evening, from work into home from striving to letting go. Do you know how amazing you are, Heather? Those of us who knew you, we were so lucky. We had you right here. She was right here, and she was a firefly. We were so lucky. And her violet hour has come. Go and bathe in your violet hour, Heather. Go and get your light. Thank you, Kelly. Uh, Lita. Yes, uh, this is the flight from the city. I'm going to play a, a note just to make sure that it's a sound check. Thank you. 
next part uh, this opportunity for family to talk we want everyone who would like to talk to have the opportunity so please try to keep your um, part short um, reasonably short and uh, Linda will um, follow at the end of the family section <laughs> to make sure that I stood up after that song because I need Lita to know something. My music profile added that song to my playlist. And I had no idea that you were going to play that song. And I think that song will mean something completely otherworldly. I'm Heather's big brother. <laughs> Both size and age. <laughs> and as I put some thoughts to paper over the last few days, over the last two weeks, maybe over my whole life, what would I say? I would just want to, want to present this this gem of a human being to, to you and just the, the paradigm of brother and sister. My very, very first memory of my entire life was standing outside a hospital window and seeing my mother in that hospital window and I remember asking, Dad, it looks like she's in prison. <laughs> Mom just had a baby with your little sister. Isn't that interesting? My first memory of my entire life would be of the day that Heather was born. Three Christmases later, Heather stole my main present. <laughs> Snack you can eat 
I made sure to get no salt added peanut butter from Trader Joe's. <laughs> Heather hated bullies. Even to this day, Heather was a staunch defender of people in this world who were always seen to be at a disadvantage. She came home one day from elementary school. I, had, I was now in middle school. She came home from elementary school. She had worked so long on a project and she had this beautiful poster and she was crying you know, because a bully on her the school bus home had ripped up her poster. And the, the crying that she, she wailed from seeing her project I, mean, I don't think it's any secret that Heather was a perfectionist. But the crying from that messed up poster still rings in my ears to this day. And I, I swore that I would always be her protective big brother. But as she got older and became Heather, she didn't need my protection. Heather was a 4-H speech genius. And I always remember being in awe that she could memorize an entire 10-minute speech, travel into the middle of nowhere USA, Tennessee, face all of these other uh, young women speakers and come away as the champion speech giver. I think you all can see where she got it later on in life and use that talent. Heather was sensitive to animals and suffering. Yet another story that won't leave my mind or my heart is we took a family trip to Florida. And this, this man here, Heather's brother-in-law, who at the time was her sister's boyfriend, decided to go, we would go hunt for crabs on the beach. And Steve had a crab bite, and he smacked down on a crab on the beach and killed the crab accidentally. And Heather didn't speak to him until six months ago. <laughs> She was always the victim of my high school reputation. As a senior in high school, uh, we had an adjoining class. My physics class, she was a, she would have been a freshman and she had a biology class. And I would always go to war with Mrs. Jones, the physics teacher. The other class would hear Miss Jones and I regaling each other with insults. Heather's class would stop talking and listen. She would sink down in her chair and cover herself with her book bag. When Mrs. Brown let her speak, her teacher would say, everyone, that's Heather's brother. <laughs> I had gone off to BYU and she said, you don't know how hard it is to follow in your footsteps. Everyone expects me to be as obnoxious and rude as you are. <laughs> When I came home from my Latter-day Saint mission to Montreal, Heather decided that she would accompany me to the mall to make sure that I dressed appropriately to rejoin society. <laughs> As we were pulling out of the mall, there was a homeless man standing in the median, and he was selling flowers. And I decided to impress her, and we pulled up, and I bought all his entire flowers. I think it was $20 or $30 worth, and I handed them to her. Even some of our most recent conversations, she always reminded me of that moment and how much that meant to her to see that her brother actually had learned to love someone else other than herself. <laughs> also, when we were both at BYU for her freshman year, she made it clear to me that she could not wait to see who I would end up marrying, so that, quote, I would get what I deserve, unquote. 
first time she met my wife, Kim, who was in my sister's and husband's trailer at BYU while Kim and I were dating. Right before I asked her to marry her later on said, I'm very disappointed. <laughs> she's beautiful. She's nice. She smiles at you. She has all of her teeth. <laughs> And Heather later realized that I had found exactly the best person for me to marry. And she always reminded me of that. Heather saved, Heather saved my life. My cousin Robert Boone is here, and he was here for his freshman year. I was married and we had a child on the way, and I had been exhibiting behaviors very similar to what Heather suffered from. And one night I was particularly rude to my cousin, and uh, a night that I had regretted my entire life. I have always tried to see the opportunity to let him know how sorry I was, but Heather, Heather said, you and I need to take a drive. <laughs> and we went for a drive and we parked the car. You don't have to excuse my French. We parked the car and I said, what's your problem? And she said, well, you either have depression or you are the biggest asshole I have ever met. <laughs> and we ever clapped. <laughs> <laughs> I can sleep that off. <laughs> but it was at Heather's insistence, because of the help she had recently received, that I reach out to those who could help. It was at Heather's insistence that I get on medication that would help. It was at Heather's insistence that I always pay attention to that. And it is because of Heather that I can lead the life that I lead. So forevermore, no matter what, no matter what sins or wrongdoings or mistakes or faults anyone on earth ever tries to lay at her feet, know this, that as her big brother, I will stand in your way and I will let you know that she saved a life. Let heaven judge her for that. I could share so much more, but I want to respect the time and give others a chance to talk about her. I will always love her. I will always get to be her big brother. Our Heavenly Father, who loves everyone in this room and on this earth, has let me know through my own personal prayers and seeking and pondering. She is happy. And she is healed. And that she can now watch over all of us. And she can make sure that her big brother finally gets to where he needs to be. Thank you. I just I was always like, what are you talking about? You 
speak like I do. <laughs> um, but no. Because we loved each other. And the one thing that we shared together was motherhood. Heather was always a very engaged aunt because my children were her first introduction to little kids. Um, when Bridger and her were at BYU, um, we had our two girls at the time, Mariah and Meredith, and they were two, three years old, and, um, a ba and Meredith was a baby. And she would babysit for me every once in a while. And there was one particular night where Steve and I decided that we needed a night away. <laughs> so we went to a hotel room, Heather came, and she stayed the night with my girls. Well, <laughs> Meredith was not happy about that. <laughs> And about 2 o'clock in the morning, we get a call from Heather that I needed to come get my girls. And Meredith has cried so much that she's thrown up all over her. <laughs> so we left, and we went and picked up our girls and brought them back to the hotel. <laughs> so that was kind of her first foray into having little kids. Um, my oldest daughter, Maria, um, nanny for Heather for about a year after her graduation. Um, we also, too, my husband, when we were down at BYU, he used to work at the hospital, and he would work odd hours. And Heather and I used to take uh, Mariah and Meredith to BYU football games um, together, and that was, that was a lot of fun. Um, she was in the room when my first son, Britton, was born, and she actually played a really cool joke on my mom. My mom was in California at the time, and Heather had her on the phone. And one of the monitors beeped or something, and my mom said, what's going on? And she goes, Mom, September can't breathe. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm looking at her going, what are you doing? <laughs> um, what, you know, that was Heather's sense of humor, right? <laughs> um, then my two boys were born, my twins, um, who changed our family dynamic. And she loved them because they were so close with her two girls. She, they were so very special to them. Lita, Marlo, I was there in the room with both of you were born. Her greatest desire was to be the best mom she could. And I want you to know that she fought valiantly and ferociously to be that mom. And looking at you two, you did a pretty good job. <laughs> right? You were two marvelous human beings, and that makes you I have always been in awe and at the scope and the reach of Heather's influence. I'm sure you can hear and you've all probably heard stories. Back in 2013, my husband and I decided that we would take our kids and go on a road trip across the country. And we went to DC and up to New York. While we're standing in front of the White House taking pictures in the midst of hundreds and hundreds of people, I hear someone call my name. And I'm, you know, and this lady who I had no idea who it was came up to me and she said, she introduced herself and she explained that she was an avid reader of Deuce.com and she recognized the twins. <laughs> <laughs> I was, I was, I could, I could not believe in DC. <laughs> she recognized the twins. Um, another time I was sitting at a BYU game, I heard my name called again, and then a lady told me, she said, I recognize your picture from news.com. Um, this was constant. It was amazing. Um, and since her death, I have talked to so many people at work and at church and all kinds of places that didn't know that Heather was my sister, but they told me that she, they followed her. They followed her for years. So her, her reach was so massive. She had no idea the impact she had on people's lives. I know that many of us in recent weeks have wondered what we could have done differently that would have changed this outcome. But unfortunately, the what ifs are too numerous and also futile. We as human beings are flawed, and therefore we will continue to make those same mistakes. But the lesson to take away from all this is to learn and to grow and try to be better with those that we love. I too have some regrets. About two months ago, I told my husband that I had just this urgency of prompting to go see her. Of course, I didn't because my life is very hectic. And I didn't go. And that will, one will sit with me for the rest of my life. But the thing 
because I'm trying to learn from that is to listen when I have a prompting to go and to do. The other thing that I know Heather would all of want us to do and have greater touch about bullies and stuff is for us to be kind to one another. No matter our differences or our disagreements or our political affiliations or anything, we should always be kind in our dealings with one another. Um, I wanted just to read you a quick text. Of, after she passed, I found myself going back and reading all of the texts and then anything I could find. Um, this was on her birthday this last year. Happy birthday. I hope your day is full of love and laughter. I'm so proud of how far you've come in your journey. I am in awe of you. Love you so much. And she texted back. Thank you so much. Today has been so much better than, than last year. It means the world to me that you reached out to me today. I want to come see your house and spend time with you and tell you how much I've missed you. I have some work to do on this rainbow-filled planet. And last night, as I was telling Mom about this calling from God, a double rainbow appeared over her house. I'm pretty sure she sent me a photo of it. But just in case she didn't, here it is with a nod to your kids and mine. Our family is pretty freaking special, Timber. And you and I are warrior moms. Last week, and I'm sure a lot of you too, my emotions have been all over the map. We were outside, and there have been so many storms lately, pretty much every night. And there appeared the prettiest rainbow I think I've ever seen over our house. And I knew it was from her. Tell me she's okay. And I know she is. And I know that I will see her again, and she will be beautiful and healthy and whole, with a clear mind and a perfect spirit. And there I will love you always until we meet again. Heather for those 72 hours 
so that Monday morning when she was put back with her mother, that she would be clean. Mm -hmm. And she was, miraculously. Mean, she just went to her mother and just kind of looked at her and touched her breast and said, <laughs> Seuss, Seuss. But she was waiting after that, uh, apples and vinegar butter. <laughs> been the choir director, song leader of every award she's ever been in, and rightly so, she's very talented. One morning she had to go in early, and left me with the three kids to get ready for church. It was kind of a hectic morning, and we come in just as sacrament was playing, and, 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 and Linda's up there teaching the first song. And I had had her, and her hair hadn't been combed. She had on an oversized white t-shirt and Indian moccasins. <laughs> she was holding Stretch Armstrong by the <laughs> And the look that the song leader gave us was one of menace. <laughs> I knew when I got home, I was going to get a crumb lecture from the way Heather went that day. Heather's childhood was happy. Now you heard from her big brother how much he protected her and he was her father in <laughs> At the age of three years old, which made her five years old, which made Ranger eight years old, I'm out front of our house in Memphis, Tennessee, and I'm washing the windows, and of course I can, the sun is back here and I can see all that's happening down there. So I'm washing windows, and the first sight I see is Ranger riding his bike, and that goes through the window. Now, our house was on an incline between us and the next street were three other houses. So here comes the bicycle, and Ranger's pedaling, and then this long rope comes into the window. And attached to this long rope is his sister sitting on a big wheel. <laughs> she has her feet up because the big wheel is going to fit. <laughs> She's got hold of this. And it was like a kung fu movie. As <laughs> soon as Heather was into my vision, I turned around and ran out to the, ran out to the sidewalk. And Ranger's eight-year-old mind, his game plan was he would go down to the next street take a hard right on the sidewalk. And his eight-year-old physics was is that rope would do that hard right <laughs> off. <laughs> and the big wheel would follow <laughs> with his passenger and make that same light of turn as easily as he had made it. I ran out there and started running down the street hollering, Ranger, hit the grass. <laughs> what? <laughs> Ranger, hit the grass! So, knowing the fear, he had my voice. <laughs> he took to the grass. And as soon as the big wheel hit the edge of the grass, Heather went into the air, face first into the turf. I'm running down there. I pick her up, turn over. She says, that was fun! Let's do that again! <laughs> Sometimes angels have to intercede when big brothers take care of little sisters. <laughs> I put Heather to bed during her childhood singing Scarborough Fair. Now, I'm not a great singer, but she would listen and then she would drop off to sleep. As a teen on her 16th birthday, we bought her a uh, used Dobson hatchback. We attached a big red bow over the car and surprised her with it. And then I took her out for driving lessons on a stick shift. Do you know how much fun that is? <laughs> Trying to teach a teenager about a stick shift. Heather was very, very, very popular in high school and very, and very, very well rewarded. She was outstanding freshman, outstanding sophomore outstanding junior. 
when he came time for senior and announced somebody else's name. I got a call at my work. And she said, Dad, can you come pick me up from work? From school. And I said, what's the matter? She said, if I can't talk now, can you come pick me up and sign me out? I said, sure. So I got off work, drive to Bartlett, and go in and sign her out, take her over to the local subway, sit down with her, and I said, what's the problem? They announced outstanding senior today, and I didn't do it. I said, okay. <laughs> What's the problem? Dad, you don't understand. I didn't get outstanding senior. And she was really upset. So I had to go into my father mode, and I just, we sit there and talk, and I said, life is not fair. It's up to us to cope with whatever's out there and to handle it. I said, just think about all the young ladies at Bartlett who suffered through their sophomore, freshman, and junior class, and they had to go call their father and say, Heather Campbell, always <laughs> this is your time to suck it up and cope with what the world has for you. She was also in uh, a high performer. She was valedictorian, and she had been called to, uh, what was it, girl? Girl State, where they discussed the state government over in Chattanooga, Tennessee, from Memphis. I think it was a week and a half or two weeks. I drove over there on a, a Friday, Saturday, got her from the dorm, and we went and had a really good time that weekend. We went to see City Slippers. Remember that? <laughs> Billy Crystal and Jack Collapse. And when Billy Crystal stuck his hand in the back end of that cow, she's Dad, don't throw up. Dad, don't throw <laughs> up. But you knew I had a really bad gag reflex. <laughs> we drove down to Georgia to see an old high school buddy and stopped and had lunch. And I really got a brand new band that I had just purchased. We had a great time then. In college, she went to BYU. It was like BYU because she went to BYU and graduated in four years. Grace and I put her in a little uh, I think it was a Honda compact, took all her belongings and installed her at BYU. About a year later, she called and said, Dad, I need a new bicycle. I said, all right, I'm going to trip out there. You and I will go shop for bicycles. I hadn't purchased a bicycle in many years, and it had been a kid's bicycle. She took me to one of the pro shops in Provo. And the first bicycle she looked at that she liked was $3,000. <laughs> now, you don't know me very well. <laughs> I said, darling, my 1968 GTO costs $3,000. <laughs> We're going to have to look at another bike shop. She said, OK, there's a penny in trouble. So we spent the day. We finally found one that she liked and she was satisfied with. And she used that throughout her, her career. Heather Hamilton was my daughter, and I loved her dearly. I remember she came home from the second grade. She said, Dad, I'm supposed to tell the class tomorrow why you call me Heather. Why did you name me Heather? I said, well, you go back and tell them tomorrow that I always wanted to go out on the front porch in the neighborhood and call you and come hither, Heather Hamilton. <laughs> Heather has departed from us. I feel sorry for the breath that she had the good demons and some of her brain cells that I could not unlock. Her mother and I try on all occasions to talk her back from the cliff. We didn't make it. But we love Heather and we love her two daughters. She's the, her two daughters are our ladies we will cherish them as being part of Heather Hamilton. I know, and I'll be there sooner than possibly anybody here in this room and to the other side, and I'll get to see her again, and she and I will be whole personalities, and we'll have a better understanding of our relationship as far as I know. And I 
wrote about Heather when she passed on LinkedIn and I had a former coworker reach out to me and she said, I had no idea you were cousin George. <laughs> so I was learning in development and she was recruiting and she was like, but knowing you and working with you, it all makes sense. <laughs> She showed me it was okay to be vulnerable, to share your story, and that everything won't be perfect, but it can still be beautiful. I spent time in Amsterdam and London last week for work, and I could feel Heather's presence with me on multiple occasions, especially in line for customs at the Salt Lake City Airport. <laughs> mentally imploring people to get their shit together <laughs> and act with any sense of urgency. I had somewhere to be. I needed to be with my people and I needed to breathe. Heather loved a lot of things. Babies, she would cry anytime she held a baby. It was the most amazing thing to see in person. You. Mabel told me to bring more Kleenex and I forgot them. <laughs> Dogs, chips and salsa, family, friends. I had like 30 plus friends who came by the house and she would feed and she would help them out with whatever they needed and like her house was their house. Talking with her entire body, which I have inherited. <laughs> Photography, writing, Traveling, competition, doing things full assed, not half assed. Um, but she loved music the most. When she came to visit and brought Lena and Marlo to Austin for cousin quality time, we spent a lot of time talking about music and the way it attaches to memories, both good and bad. And I'm lucky enough to have a lot of wonderful musical memories with Heather. Uh, in November of 2006, um, Linda invited me out to Thanksgiving at their cabin in Duchesne. And it sticks out for a lot of things. I got a speeding ticket for going 125 miles per hour. Sorry. <laughs> Um, but one day, Lita, you were taking a nap, you were three at that time, and my roommate, Andy, myself, John, and Heather, and we went, we went out and got in the Nissan Xterra, and we drove around your shame to go look at land. Um, it was especially special because my father, Daniel, and David, his brother had bought land in Duchesne up on a peak that you could like, this amazing, beautiful view. My father passed away seven years ago from leukemia, and Uncle David passed away two years ago from brain cancer. Um, so that's special for that, but it's also special because we were listening to music the entire time we were walking away. You can probably guess which album was. It was Nico Case, and I remember her, I can see her singing with every part of her body, maybe Sparrow, the la di da di da di da part, and that will stick with me forever. In the summer of 2007, when the unnecessary roommate, yet sometimes comedic relief, yet sometimes serious roommates came by, that's me, um, Listen to music a lot. Hanging out in y'all's office, writing. Ryan Adams, Easy Tiger. She listened to that over a hundred times that two and a half months I was there. And then in the fall of 2007, Radiohead released an album. Uh, and if you know Heather, you know she loves her British pop. <laughs> And there's a song on that album that closes out the album. I want to read the lyrics to you today. It's called Videotape. 
So I'll be reading from the Church of Tom York. <laughs> when I'm at the pearly gates, this will be on my videotape. My videotape. Mephistopheles is just beneath, and he's reaching up to grab me. This is one for the good days, and I have it all here. In red, blue, green. In red, blue, green. And you are my sinner when I spin away, out of control, in videotape. This is my way of saying goodbye. Because <clears throat> I can't do it face to face. So I'm talking to you before, no matter what happens now. You shouldn't be afraid. Because I know today has been the most perfect day I've ever seen. We were all Heather's center. But especially you, Marlo. We back up. You, Lita, her frog baby. And especially you, Linda. If you ever want to know about her and Linda's relationship, read her book. Victoria being that Linda and I sat down and talked for an hour yesterday and it was, I just let her know that that's a love story to you, Linda. Heather was in a great deal of pain for 25 years. And I miss her very much. But I know that she's free. Well, my mom wouldn't say the F word, so I'm going to sit through this part. <laughs> I can tell you that Heather's looking down on all of us, and what she wants to say is wink, wink, mother effers. <laughs> <laughs> stubborn, but she was one of the strongest people that I've ever known. For my whole life, I've never doubted her mother had so much love in her heart for her kids, for her family, for Pete, for everyone. These past couple of days, everyone has been coming up to me and saying, you know, your mother loved you very much, and I am well aware of that. She didn't even have to tell me. From the tears, you know, she had the piano recitals, to like holding her head at the doctor's office, to the monthly newsletters that she wrote me when I was young. She was always there, always protective, caring, and compassionate. My mother was a trailblazer, an inspiration, and due to her relatability, a source of comfort for many. Um, but I don't have to tell you these things, um, because most of you probably only know them. Um, instead, however, I wanted to tell you about things you might not know. Um, she was effortlessly charismatic. She was hilarious, both online and in real life. She was beautiful inside and out. Her laugh was heartwarming. Her voice was strong. Her smile comforted everyone in the room. She went to 14 Radiohead concerts, and her favorite song, Let Down, was not played at any of them. <laughs> <laughs> so shout out George for mentioning Radiohead. Um, she was always very good at giving all of our dogs tough love, very good at training all of them. She played volleyball as a kid. She fostered my love for music. She taught me how to take care of my hair. 
She was the only one in our immediate family who had perfect vision. She could read me like the back of her hand. No one has ever understood me like my mother has. She could listen to songs and then we could play them on the piano. She had a natural ear for music, which I was always jealous of. Um, she was so passionate, so full of emotion and love and life. And she inspired me to live authentically and take risks. I've always admired everything about her. Her ambition, her grit, her intelligence, her creativity. There are so many aspects of her that me and so many other people have admired for years and years. I could go on, but um, my mother has been a person so many people could look up to and confide in, and she was a reminder that no one is alone. I owe so much to her. My confidence, my strength, my independence, my music taste. Um, I love and I miss her so much. And I know that everyone has different beliefs about what happens after death. Um, but there's this poem that I really like that I want to share with people. Um, this poem is called Do Not Stand on My Grave and Weep. You know, but there is no grave, so let's just like for the sake of the poem, just pretend that they're, you know. <laughs> um, you know um, it's called Do Not Stand on My Grave and Weep by Mary Elizabeth Fry. Um, kind of just encapsulates. Do not stand on my grave and weep. I am not there. I do not sleep. I am the thousand winds that blow. I am the diamond glints on snow. I am the sunlight on reddened grain. I am the gentle autumn rain. When you awaken in the morning's hush, I am the swift uplifting rush of quiet birds and circles of light. Circles of light. I am the soft stars that shine at night. Do not stand on my grave and cry. I am not there. world 
Avon World Sales Leader. I'll share and explain what that is, but it's exactly what it means. <laughs> I, I was one of 10 or 20 people that was number one in the world for two or three years. So, uh, and I managed people who made me a lot of money and took me to all the places in the world. I want to tell you that my sweet Rob is not here today, and um, he's not doing well, and he, for those of you all who know, he is struggling very, very much. Um, first of all, I want to tell you that Mike got a really big grab of applause, and it's because he mentioned my breasts. <laughs> Um, the last 20 years, I talked to Heather every day. Some good, some bad. She has been struggling with depression and anxiety since before she was in high school. I knew her heart. And I could not give it a name. I didn't know about depression and anxiety until she was in college. And she called us one day when she was a sophomore in college, I believe, and she basically was suicidal. She didn't know what to do. She was wrapped up in a fetal position in, in one of the bedrooms, and, and we, I, I, I called my brother, who was a therapist, and, and I had just read an article about depression, and there was 10 things that you checked off, and I, I said, Louis, is it possible that she suffers from depression? He said, absolutely. And within days, he had her at a therapist, and he put her on Zola, the the uh, the permanent the temporary cure for depression in the Bidoon family. Mm -hmm. But Heather suffered from drug resistant depression, and I ha we have family here. I, I want to want to tell you, it, this this is so prevalent in our family, and I'm I'm, I'm not going to have everybody stand up who suffers from depression. <laughs> <laughs> There's a lot of us in our family that, that does, and but I want to tell you that today, Heather, first of all, oh my God, we're all talking to you today. We're all talking to you today. All these people love you so much. Let me tell you, you have cousins and aunts in the Boone family here today from Oregon, Idaho, Wyoming, Kentucky, Texas, Arizona, and Utah. Isn't that amazing? My brother drove from Kentucky in, in, in two days to be here for this. We have family from, uh, this family is from everywhere. She has more, she loved her cousins and they, they're here today. You heard, you heard from one of them, George, and she loved them, and they were so much a part of her family. Um, this, so many people stole all my stories. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm going to pick up her life when she graduated from BYU. If I have regret in my life, she always wanted to go to BYU. And within, within two or three months after she got there, we realized that was one of the biggest mistakes we ever made, was sending her to a place. She was a butterfly. Mm, you can't be a big butterfly at BYU because they, they, there's their restrictions and there are all kinds of things. And all she wanted to do was fly. But she sucked it in, right? <laughs> and she graduated from BYU. And on the day she graduated from BYU, she left the Mormon faith and lived a little while in Salt Lake City, and then she was off to L.A. And you know what? She, she, she learned, she grew up in L.A. And she and I were about this far apart for a while. And then she met John. And she called, she, she called me, because we didn't text then, there were no cell phones. But she called me and said, I have looked into the eyes the man who's going to be the father of my children. And she recognized that and all she ever wanted to do was have a family. 
and they got married and moved into my basement <laughs> for four months until they could get a house bought and they bought a beautiful home and, and redid so much of it on Sherman Avenue. And that's where, uh, were both of you girls born? When you, both you, you, you were born, and by the way, I was at, I was at her birth, I, I was there, and Marlo, I was at her birth, and Marlo was born with her eyes open. <laughs> Can you tell? <laughs> but uh, she, she wanted children, and I, ha I have a story. I'm going to tell you a story. My mother lost a child in 1950. A little five-month-old baby girl. And her name was Lita. Lita K. And when Lita was born, she never had never told me what the name of this child was. She didn't tell anybody. And she said, before we tell you what her name is going to be, can you get Granny Boone? Granny Boone lived with us. That was my mother. And bring her to the hospital. And we probably got Granny Boone and brought her to the hospital. And that's when she told us that they were naming their baby Lita after mother's baby that she lost. And my mother, I, I don't think, first of all, I don't think she ever got over the fact that someone loved her enough to name their baby after her little baby girl that had been long almost forgotten in the family. Well, she's not forgotten now. <laughs> because Lena Elise reminds us every day that loss and despair when you lose a child can be can can be covered by another child that comes into the world. And I like to think that one of the first people that Lena said hello to when she reached the other side was Lena K. Because why wouldn't she look for her? Because she was the, the namesake of her child. When, when they when, when John John and she moved in and and she became famous, and I don't even need to tell you that. But And I don't need to tell you what kind of mother she was, because you just saw it just right here. But I, I do need to tell you that as a mother, mother in depression, mother and a child who has depression, is such a painful journey. And I want everyone in this room who knows someone with depression to give them the benefit of the doubt that there is pain and sorrow that that is so deep in their hearts. And if you have never suffered from depression, and I never have, you just give them the benefit of the doubt. I had a friend when she heard that I had that Heather has taken her own life, wrote me a song, and I'm gonna read the words to you. It's one of the most beautiful things I've ever heard. The name of this song is The name of the song is This Mama Knows. In every tear I cried for you, if every tear I cried for you could wash away your pain, I'd never stop the tears from falling till you were bathed in grace. If every prayer I sent to heaven called angels to your side, I'd never let a moment pass in silence, day or night. All my heart, mind, and soul is wrapped up in the grief and joy of seeing you made whole. Grief for when you're hurting, joy for your relief, hope that you will come to find the mercy at his feet that this mama knows. If every time I thought of you, a sunflower would grow, I'd wander through the memories and bask in fields of gold. And though the rain falls steady now, soon the sun will shine, and every broken heart will feel the peace of the divine. All of us will break sometime, but unlike certain nursery rhymes, we're never too far broken for the father of us all, this mama knows. That gives me so much comfort. So now back to the story. They were married. The girls were born. Life, life took its toll. She, she spent uh, 
so much grief and pain and sorrow at that time. And there was a time when Rob and I almost lived with her for a while to keep her on this earth. And uh, she went through the treatment at the university and then she met this man. She met the love of her life. And he was. He was the love of her life. And he was the love of my life too because he loved her. He loved her. And she, she was in this wonder that any man could ever offer to her what he did. And he did. And I, I want us all to remember to love, to cherish, and to be what we can be to those who suffer and struggle. Heather always took care of the downtrodden. And there are so many stories out there that, that I have read and that I have heard. But because this is such a crazy talk and I'm all over the place, I have, a, I have a card, a sympathy card that I got in the mail to read. And this card wasn't to me, it was to Heather. Listen to this. Heather, thank you for doing your best for us as long as you could. Each day with you, most precious, we have hope that you can watch over us all, perhaps even influence us toward the right thing. Soften our hearts toward family unity, forgiveness and faith, and comfort us during low injury and heartache. May we find your positive influence, and may we feel it. We may we feel the spirit of our Heavenly Father as it gradually and gently distills upon our souls as the dews of heaven. And that was written out of the blue. I get this card, and it was from Steve's brother. This is September's husband, who I, I have known. I have known Mike a long time in my life, I, and it meant so much to me that he he thoughtfully wrote this note to Heather to say we miss you and we know you're going to be around. I have one more thing to tell you. A couple of days after Heather passed away, we were sitting in a restaurant with family. And I, my phone rang and I go, must be something important. Heather has just passed away. There has This must be a call. And it was from the Daily Wire in the UK. Mm -hmm. The Daily Wire in the UK and they wanted to comment from me. And first of all, I thought it was mighty intrusive for them to get my number and call me. And, and they said, do you have a comment? And I said, well, of course we're devastated. And she said, well, I, something a little more than that. And I said, well, let me tell you something. <laughs> <laughs>
and I will have a vacancy in my heart, I think, forever. Because you can't talk to somebody every day for 20 years and not expect them to call on Monday morning. That would be very hard for me. Monday morning, Heather, will, will you call me B? <laughs> <laughs> Guys, thank you for being here. Thank you for being here. Thank you for loving my daughter, my precious daughter, who could not, who could not live through through anything else. Who had fought? She told me she had fire in her veins many times. Her anxiety was so bad, but the Lord loves her. Oh my God, we all love her. We know that, and I am so grateful to have had this beautiful opportunity to, be, to give you all a view of Heather. What an absolutely amazing family. Lita, you're up again. This is a cold play, the scientist.
I knew Howard since I've known Howard since I was 12 years old, and it was amazing. And um, it's just so good to see uh, Linda. Anyway, I didn't say hi later, but um, I didn't even start my period when I met Heather. <laughs> and um, uh, when I found out that she passed, um, my friend C. Jane Kendrick, who was a blogger successful in her own right because of Heather. Um, she messaged me and told me. Um, and I was at work. And, um, and I wrote the following while I was at work trying to process. Um, I don't have a southern accent, even though I grew up in the south, but it's coming back. Like, I can't even, I don't even know what's happening. Um, part one I wrote the day I found out Part two, I wrote the next day. Part one. There's a 12-year-old girl inside of me that is so timid, afraid that she looks like a troll with bright orange hair. She moved to a huge city from a very small town. She's so worried her bangs don't look right. She loves the way her turquoise sweater looks with her baby pink skirt. But she doesn't know if there's anything else going for her. Even this is questionable because Mom drilled it into her, me, that with her red hair, she should only be wearing fall colors. I'm the new girl in a very small Sunday school class, and Heather turns to 12-year-old me and says, I love the way your sweater and skirt clash so perfectly. <laughs> I wore that outfit ridiculously often after that day. It was a big win for me in my anguished internal world. After knowing Heather for a few weeks, she confessed to me that she'd cry in her bathroom waiting for the school bus if her veins didn't behave that morning. I felt less alone. I was always the tallest. Heather was taller. I felt less alone. Heather was an honor student, so was I. Like I had with all my friends' older brothers, I had a huge crush on hers. All over all the bridge now. <laughs> Her mom was gregarious in a patriarchal community, so was mine. She was the youngest of three, I was the oldest of three. Having been born two and a half months before me meant she was smarter and wiser, more mature to the 12 year old me. She, we laughed so much, we talked about sex. We watched B horror movies at our sleepovers. We put each other's or someone else's bra in the freezer when they'd fallen asleep. We write on someone's face with a sharpie or squirt shaving cream on someone's forehead and stick Cheetos in it. We shared tents and cabins at girls' camp. We talked about our faith, 
Um, I'll probably skip the next part if there's children in the room. Um, I felt safe cussing in front of her until we decided we needed to cool it. I was jealous of her. I loved her. For weeks after, she pray uh, for, the, for, for a few weeks after she praised the pleasantly clashing turquoise sweater and pink skirt, I prayed nightly, and I mean every single goddamn night, that we become close friends. And when we did, I believed it was God answering my prayer. Twelve-year-old Ashley never would have believed that one day Heather and I would be both so fucking far out of Mormonism that we'd be embarrassed we were ever in it. <laughs> Part two. In quotes, something broke. She didn't have to tell me that something had broken inside of her. I could see it. She was sitting on my couch on a snowy light in 2016, and her eyes were raw orbs of desperation. I didn't understand at the moment just how broken she was. We were both single moms whose baby daddies lived in other states, both doing all the heavy lifting. We determined in our many conversations regarding our situation that time was our only commodity. We were both strapped financially, depleted in all other ways, and when we get a spare hour here or half hour there, it was like a surprise vacation. We had both been reduced to goldfish in a bowl when they'd get a shake of food flakes. So I regarded her sentiment that night of brokenness and kindredship, but it was more than that. Way more than my own single mom fight. So where do we go from here? And that's the end of what I wrote. Where do we go? She tried everything, and she tried everything for those two right there. Um, when I was shopping for a dress, which was a fucking nightmare for this service, I could picture Heather going at me the whole time. This dress was $150, I'm returning it tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> you can probably see the cardboard tab for that. Um, and I know Heather thinks that's just hilarious. Um, I was very lucky to be able to reconnect with Heather when I moved to Salt Lake in 2015. She would say to me, Ashley, I'm so glad you're back in my life. And, um, I guess that's all I have to say. Two hours of time for me. And uh, I thought we were going to be really good friends for a long time. Uh, but that's not the reason I think that he might regret inviting me. I'm going to read to you something she wrote. I was told to find something she wrote from August 4th, 2014. <laughs> I have become my father when it comes to fighting. <laughs> God, I love saying that. I really hope you read that. But my father does, like, does not like to talk or recognize bodily functions. And once when I was a kid, I heard him fart in the kitchen, and I thought it was so funny, as all kids do. I was around the corner in the living room at the, at the time, and came barreling through the kitchen door with laughter about to erupt from my face, only to be greeted with a look I imagine serial killer. <laughs> and they sew together the outfit they are constructing from the skin and hair of the person they have just been It said very succinctly and convincingly, you heard nothing. <laughs> we never spoke of it. And this is the first time in my life that I'm acknowledging that, yes, oh yes, 
I heard something, <laughs> and it was loud. <laughs> I don't think other functions are funny like I used to as a kid, or even five years ago. Maybe because parenthood has wrenched all the fun out of it. All the diapers and throw up and potty training and running to catch poop as it comes out of my kid's butt so it doesn't get in the carpet. Ugh. Not to mention dogs. Good God, dog parts are not funny. <laughs> dog parts are chemical weapons. They clear rooms and ruin meals and break up friendships. I am in therapy over a dog fart. <laughs> now, when one of my kids hears me fart, which is rare, <laughs> point it out, I say, we should really have your hearing check, as it is not function. <laughs> and then I turn back to the corpse on my table. They will one day write publicly about the time they heard it, and that's fine. I don't care. Because one day they will have kids of their own, and endure the daily ins and outs of poop and pee and vomit and liquid spilled on every surface of everything that ever existed. When one of those kids points out a fart in their first inclination, will be yelled, guess what? You came out of my vagina. She would want to. You came out of my vagina. So technically, you're a walking queen. <laughs> 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 but that's the first time that word has been heard in this. Um, <laughs> I don't have any idea where the original tangent was going. Damn it, not at all. Maybe I'll remember when 75% of my brain is not occupied with making sure that the younger of my offspring does not get constipated. Sorry. <laughs> One day, she will buy and administer her own fiber supplement, and then she does. I will dramatically smoke a cigarette on a balcony overlooking the sunset as the credits roll on my um, Thank you for giving me two minutes because um, it's important to me. I didn't get a chance to say these things to Heather. This is Fit. Um, my name is Piper Benjamin. Um, I was friends with Heather for many years. I'm really proud to be the friend of Heather's, actually, who um, I was the friend who could irritate her the most. And <laughs> it's really true, and I took a lot of pride in that role, <laughs> and I will always. I just want to quickly tell you, um, today, even though I irritated her the most always and um, drove her crazy, I want to honor you, Heather, today by telling you the things I've loved about you. Heather, I loved that you felt feelings in such a big way that it made me wonder if I felt anything at all. I loved your beautiful handwriting. I loved that you were fierce and challenging. I loved your unique chin and your long, slender limbs. I loved that you were a perfectionist who didn't like second place because I don't either. Heather, you love creative minds, intelligence, and beautiful things. Art, sculpture, design, architecture, dimples, dancers, flowers, and fancy gardens, foreign places, trinkets, and treasures, self-expression, a good haircut and blowout, gorgeous furniture, music of all sorts, dressing for a mood, the mysteries of life and people, and a good laugh. I love all these things too, and I loved you, Heather. To Lita and Marlo, thank you for sharing much of your childhood with me and my family. Thank you for sharing your mother. I love you both, and I'm here for you, always. To John, thank you for always welcoming me, welcoming me into your lives. You are a fantastic person and father. And Pete, thank you for telling me that I love me. It has helped me feel more than you know. We are here for you always, too. And I'd like to finish with a... Um, from 
Heather from her um, website. This was July 21st, 2014. Saturday was my 39th birthday. These flowers are from my friend Piper, and attached was a card that read, I'll preface this by saying that you saw the elephant picture. She had been in Indonesia and, and loved having the elephants around her. Anyway, her birthday card said, Heather, I think deep down you really hate elephants. <laughs> Happy birthday. <laughs> I'm so grateful for the friendships I've forged in the last few years with several women who love me despite all my many glaring flaws. They make me feel safe, and I don't have to worry about being judged for my mistakes and issues that rear their ugly heads again and again. I name them all here, but they know who they are. I love you so much. Thank you. Heather, you were larger than life. I hope we meet again. Yehizicha Baruch, which translated from Hebrew means, may her memory be a blessing. Thank you. struggling young mother, I had been reading Deuce um, for quite a while. Um, and so I felt like Heather was already my best friend. I knew Heather. And I could not believe my luck when I saw the class list and I saw the name Lita Armstrong. <laughs> and I was so excited. I was like, oh my gosh, I get to realize my dream of Deuce being my best friend. <laughs> um, <coughs> Before school started, um, I shared with some of the other moms uh, that you know, my good luck and our good luck, that this was happening. And there was one particular mom who uh, shall remain nameless. She, she freaked out, she, and not in a good way. Um, she, uh, notwithstanding my attempts to assuage her fears, because um, after all, Heather was my best friend, <laughs> um, she stormed into the headmaster's office with fire and brimstone, worried that Heather might post photos of her child. She wouldn't, um, or write stories about her child. She wouldn't. The results of this was a very uh, carefully and warmly crafted letter from Heather and John emphasizing uh, that they take their child's privacy very seriously and that they would never, ever post anything about their child, um, uh, child school, uh, or any other children. Um, and, you know, parents could be safe. This was not going to happen. And so when we got that letter and I read it, I felt terrible because I knew I was the one that had caused that mother to march in there. And so I wrote Heather a letter and um, I just gushed and said, oh, there are some of us that are very, very happy to have you right now. <laughs> um, your best friend. <laughs> and so um, when I finally met Heather in person, after the school year started, um, I really embarrassingly and nervously blurted out, hi, I'm your number one fan. <laughs> So, um, but for some reason, she completely overlooked uh, my fan girling, and we clicked. Um, because, you know, we're her best friends. <laughs> um, so, our friendship deepened when the love of my life died by his own hand um, at the end of about 2013. And when this happened, Heather was the one person that I wanted to talk to that I knew could shed some light on what was happening um, and what had happened. Mm -hmm. And so 
she wrote about this experience both in her book and, and on her website. And um, uh, she being so much more eloquent than I, um, I want to um, share uh, an excerpt um, from August 25th, uh, 2014. Last December, my friend Stacia's fiance committed suicide. As friends and family gathered immediately to her home, I waited until the right moment to pull her aside and listen to her pain, which at the time was so bone crushing that I thought her tiny frame would collapse beneath the weight of it. I held her as she sobbed and screamed and pounded her fists into her thighs, a wailing why, punctuating every sentence. I pulled her close and said, I know you were angry and hurt, and you were going to be angry and hurt for a long time. But I know where he had to be to do this to himself. I know that kind of pain that I have lived with that kind of pain. And I know that you loved him so much that if you had the tiniest glimpse of the agony he must have been feeling in that moment, that you would grant him that he did not do this to himself. His depression and suffering did this to him. Stacia and I have always been close since we met in 2019, or 20, 2009. Um, but since her fiance's suicide, our friendship has become one of the strongest I have ever had. I have spent many nights with her, with her listening to her cry, holding her as she continued to ask why. And as she talked of the plans they had made, the memories they had already created. Early on in her grief, while listening to the anguish in every word that she spoke, I had the sudden, a sudden realization that if her fiance could somehow witness this devastation, this ongoing trauma that will last for years, this haunting unknowing that will come back in waves throughout the rest of her life, that maybe it would have been the one thing that could have pulled him back from that edge. The grief you might cause when you think about suicide is very abstract. It's not a real thing, at least not in the confines of your compromised brain. Often you have convinced yourself that no one will miss you. If he could touch her grief with his hands, would it have mitigated his own? Heather, even for just a moment, I wish you could have touched our grief with your hands. But I know you were exhausted. You were tired of fighting. You were tired of suffering. I hope you were friendly. Uh, hello, I'm Matthew Workman, and it will, it's complicated, but for purposes of this, it's important to know that I was the humor editor, humor editor of Student Review back in 1995 when she started writing for that newspaper. And I thought you might be interested in some of the material that she wrote. I will not read the particular article that is in this issue. I will only read you the headline, and you'll understand why I'm not going to read it. The headline is simply, 22-pound midget wins cougar eat contest. <laughs> it is wildly inappropriate. And the only thing more embarrassing than the fact that she wrote it is that if the masthead is to be believed, I edited it. <laughs> so leave that aside, because she did write better stuff. And I will read to you a single paragraph from one of those uh, pieces, and then uh, share just a tiny little bit of one more piece, and then I will let other people talk. This was from keeping with the scatological theme of some of this evening's remembrances, BYU bathrooms, where to go when you've got to go. <laughs> I give you the Brim Hall building. If you and your fiancé are unworthy to marry in the temple, you should opt and opt happily for the Brim Hall building bathroom ceremony. <laughs> there are two ceiling-high mirrors placed strategically on opposite walls so that as you are drying your hands, you can gaze far into eternity. 
hues of celestial gray mingled with squares of celestial white. In the shepherd board pattern across the floor, your inactive uncle can attend the ceremony too. <laughs> and there's plenty of tissue for those special bow moving moments. <laughs> and uh, I will share with you another piece that was unpublished. It's actually a letter that she sent to me when I lived in Los Angeles and she was living here. And I did make reference to the fact that it's complicated. And this was at a period of time where things were especially complicated. We hadn't had a lot of contact in some time. She had heard that I was poor and that at any given day I didn't know where my next meal was coming from. She was a recent graduate from college and had a job. <laughs> so an envelope arrived. It was from her. and. It was, uh, it was a check for 50 bucks, which for an early college grad is a lot of money. And for me at that time in my life, it was an unfathomably large amount of money. And she enclosed a letter, it was printed, and it contained a single word, and that word was simply eat. Thank you. So sorry. Heather was my aunt. And I love I love her very much. I realized something while I was sitting down and having everyone come up. Heather understood people. I brought my boyfriend today and we were in the back and my boyfriend told me. I love how this crowd isn't so Mormon. <laughs> I said, yeah, that's true. It's built with so many different people and places and so many different friends and family. I know that she understood me. She understood all of them, all of us in her family. There was a uh, poem I really just wanted to share. Like Lita, I didn't prepare anything, but I feel like this poem just really just says my feelings right now. It's called The Dash Poem. It says, I read of a man who stood to speak at the funeral of a friend. He referred to the dates on the tombstone from the beginning to the end. He noted first came the date of the birth and spoke the following date with tears. But he said what mattered most of all was the dash between the years. For that dash represents all the time that they spent life on earth. And now only those who love them know what that little line is worth. For it matters not how much we own, the cars, the house, the cash. What matters is how we live and love and how we spend our dash. So think about this long and hard. Are there things you'd like to change? For you never know how much time is left that can still be rearranged. If we could just slow down enough to consider what's true and real, and always try to understand the way other people feel. Be less quick to anger and show appreciation more. And love the people in our lives like we've never loved before. If we treat each other with respect and more often wear a smile, remembering that this special dash might only last a little while. So when your eulogy is being read with your life's actions to rehash, would you be proud of the things they say about how you spent your dash? Heather, all of us are proud of how you spent your dash. We love you. Just know we always love you. Thank you. Really sorry to everyone who wanted to talk and what wasn't able to. Uh, William Hagen. Hagen. William Hagen. It's a piece of violin sonata by uh, J.S. Bach. 
And then after William's piece, we'll be going out. We'll be going outside. So it's a break time. Yeah, and I'm supposed to mention, speaking of chips and salsa, that Heather told Pete many, many times at her funeral she absolutely had there had to be chips and salsa. So we got chips and salsa. Thank you. 
Thank you, William. Pete, did you want me to say anything about Heather and Sunsets? Was there some significance there? Just that the golden hour was very special to her. Right, right. So, so go appreciate it. Go appreciate it. OK, um, so about 15 minutes we'll be back? 9 o'clock. At 9 o'clock, OK. Thank you, everyone. It's Lita eating chips and salsa. Uh, she's going to perf Lita's going to perform one more piece, cinematic orchestra um, to build a home.
I will now performatively weep for three hours. <laughs> That was my ringtone for Heather, her laughing at me. The light that burns twice. The light that burns twice as bright burns half as long. And you have burned so very, very brightly, Heather. Heather would tell me how much she loved a slow crescendo in music, a piece that started building layer by layer and ended with the guitars, synthesizers, and choir at full volume. So I'm going to start at the bottom. It takes an ocean not to break. Heather told me these were the only words, aside from her children's names, she ever considered tattooing on her body. I sailed that ocean through amazing vistas and endless night skies, but also through raging storms, wild tempests, and dangerous shoals. In the five years we were together, we lived multiple lifetimes, and I am humbled, humbled and thankful for it. How can I not want more. When Heather and I started our relationship, I was aware of three Ds, deuce, depression, and death. They were the ever-present static in our relationship. It wasn't until about a year in, a fourth D became clear to me, drinking. All these items would converge to construct a fifth D and destroy the woman I love. I do not think any of us can really comprehend the wounds and scars her meteoric career left on her. It was not only the haters, the people who came after her without abandon. It was a celebrity and the subsequent inability to live a quiet, private life. Whenever I receive a one-star review for my business, for things that are usually a misunderstanding or a mistake, it is an arrow to my heart. Imagine having your face on Google reviews and people doing the same for everything you are. Imagine having your health and appearance constantly critiqued. For the sensitive woman who was once a child who had to be distracted from seeing roadkill on family trips, it was a level of brutality few can understand. Heather was a trailblazer of many things on the internet, but having a dedicated group of fellow humans dehumanize you incessantly, publicly, was a first she didn't deserve. Another, as another internet old timer who has been responsible for growing and promoting it, much of what it is today leaves me ashamed. We have not evolved to handle the internet and social media. We are more connected than ever, but the distance continues to grow between each other. These past couple of weeks have brought many friends to our house to eat with us, to sit and talk on our porch. It has been the best therapy I could possibly have. I can only wonder what it could have done for Heather and why we are reminded to only come together in tragedy. Depression and death were her subtitles. She wrote and lived these topics more than anything else. It is undisputed that by doing so, she helped many people. But I believe my mistake with Heather was believing there is a cure. She once remarked after a psychedelic mushroom trip, she saw the wound of her depression closing up. And who wouldn't want to see that? Yet, in retrospect, it is not how any of this works. 
I stopped counting after a dozen suicide attempts over my five years with Heather. In every one, in every one, except the last, she threw me a line to save her. I did so willingly. I wanted her to live. And every time, to, every time she told me she wanted to die, I reminded her of how much I loved her, how much her children loved her, and my children loved her, how much we had seen, and how much more there was to see. We had plans to visit Europe again this summer, and we had purchased a motorhome that we were both excited about. She was beyond elated to see the cure, the cure performed this June, a band she had never seen, but Lita's middle name, Elise, was inspired from. She ordered art supplies, which arrived the day she died. And I can think of nothing more Van Gogh. When I first became aware of her drinking, much of it was after being informed by a good friend of Heather's, I was committed to helping her stop. I had watched my brother lose a wife to alcohol and did not want to share his fate. I held an intervention, an intervention which enraged Heather. There are many times that Heather had no fucks to give, but there were plenty given out that day. <laughs> I was able to calm her and get her to a therapist for an emergency joint session. In that session, Heather was told first she needed to stop lying to me. This was never embraced. We tried, we tried tapering the alcohol, logging the alcohol, going days without alcohol, and attempting to substitute the alcohol with other activities. None of it worked. Then finally, in April of 2021, a round of verbal abuse was hurled at me after I'd done nothing but love her, cook dinner, and clean the kitchen. I went to where she was working in her office, pulled the water bottle out of her bag, which she regu regularly filled with vodka, poured it out on the floor, and told her that it was either the alcohol or me. Again, Heather was enraged. She screamed at me that she was going to make my life a misery. After sobering up and a talk with her mother, she committed to going to an inpatient program. At that inpatient program, which I accompanied her to, we were informed, that the damage, informed of the damage that she had done to her brain. Yet it would repair itself in three to five years of sobriety. There was a future that could be had with their help and her dedication. They prescribed drugs that would help her beat the addiction. Within one week of sobriety, Heather decided she didn't need the drugs. 43 days later, she declared to the world that she was sober of a 22-year-old alcohol, 22 alcohol addiction. She repeatedly told me as we vacationed through Europe with the vi finest wines presented at our table that she would never drink again that she had lost her appetite for it, and her alcoholism had been cured. I repeatedly told her, with tears in my eyes, that I was so thankful for her sobriety because it had given us a future. Yet in res retrospect, it is not how any of this works. There was almost an imperceptible decline over the past year. Heather stopped going to concerts with me that she had been excited for when they were announced. Her days began to empty as she feared going out in public and was convinced that nobody wanted to be her friend. She watched me work, complete projects, and cook for the family and responded with her life had no meaning. I disavowed her of this every time but the alcohol and the depression stopped my words from reaching her heart. 
Looking back at photos from Christmas, a time she normally relished, her appearance was ghostly and her attitude was bleak. After her death, I found the credit card transactions. This was the time she had relapsed. I was informed after Heather's death that the most dangerous time for relapse is between 20 and 24 months after sobriety starts. This squares with what happened. Her shame and losing her very public sobriety fueled her drinking in a feedback loop. My efforts begging her to stop, I believe, only amplified that shame. The months leading up to Heather's suicide had some really horrible events. The details of not only her death, but the time before do not need to be related here. I want to speak to my children and her children and tell them that the, world, the woman they loved, <laughs> loved them. Alcohol changed her in awful and unpredictable ways. I hope they can carry this lesson forward, that your bodies are a gift. Be ever cautious, careful, and prudent with what you put into them. In the days following her death, I realized Heather wanted all the things I want, to be sober, to be an attentive parent, to be an affectionate partner, to help others while helping herself. <coughs> However, she was incapable of doing so. I expected Heather to emerge from her cocoon, a beautiful healed butterfly, but her emotional and physical injuries were too great. She could no more shake off her wounds than a veteran confined to a wheelchair can get up and dance. Her physical health was a constant struggle. Her depressive mental health became her identity. And although those, although those seas were calm at times and her brilliant light blinded me with her warmth and love, she simply could not find contentment. She fought valiantly, valiantly against her demons and kept them at bay much longer than anyone expected. It is tragic beyond Greek proportions. Heather and I first met around 1997. She was fond of recounting a story where her boss, who subleased some space from X Mission to run a web translation business, asked if she wanted to meet Pete. Heather had no idea who that was, so she responded yes, and Dave marched her off to my office. Now, unfortunately, my head is filled with useless computer nerd data and movie trivia, and I have no recollection of this momentous occasion. <laughs> According to Heather, Dave walked her into my office and said, Pete, this is Heather. My response, according to Heather, was to look up from my keyboard and grunt. <laughs> Halloween of 2016, I texted our mutual friend Ivy and asked where the parties were because I didn't have my kids that day and was all alone in my divorced dad Congo. She invited me to Heather's house. I showed up in an inflatable dinosaur costume <laughs> and accompanied them to another house for a party. When I drove Heather home that night, I told her I needed someone to watch Black Mirror with. That's a real pickup line. <laughs> she looked out the passenger window as we stopped, quietly responded with, good night, and left. She never reached out. In August of 2017, after an on-again, off-again relationship that I had finally turned off for good, I ran into Heather at a fundraiser for Ivy's MS treatment. This time I pressed her. Heather, I've seen you on the dating apps, and I always swipe right. <laughs> what is up? She laughed and claimed ignorance. She tried to push another woman into dating me at the table. But that wasn't who I was interested in. I asked her if she wanted to take a ride in my vintage Jeep, and she said yes. We drove around downtown with the wind whipping her blonde manes. 
When we came, came back, we parted, and eventually I went home without her number. Later, as I was lying in bed, my friend Jolene called me and said, I think you need to come back here. I've convinced Heather to go have drinks with you. I sent Jolene a photo of my bare feet, but got out of bed, got dressed, and returned to meet the woman who floored me with how much I enjoyed her company. Heather confessed, whenever my face had come up on the dating apps, she couldn't make a decision. So she just quit the app to reshuffle. <laughs> we stayed until closing and I walked her to the car. I messaged her on Facebook and said, I had a great time tonight. Could I please have your phone number instead of having to message you on Facebook like a peasant? <laughs> she sent me her number. After the first two weeks, she looked at me across the couch and asked, do you love me? I hesitated. It always seemed risky to say that too early. Yet our connection was clear. What is the terrible risk in showing love, I thought. Yes, I said. Over the next three months, we traveled to a central Utah ranch on a weekend excursion and to Portland to see Coldplay. My love for this woman who shared my tastes in music, art, and culture widened and deepened. One day I noticed Pitchfork had posted a video on YouTube of a Sigur Rós concert with the LA Philharmonic from the prior summer. I had attended this concert and sent the link off to Heather with a note saying so. She responded, if I had been at this concert, I would have run out of tears. I wondered if they were still touring anywhere. I checked, and as luck would have it, they were winding up the tour in Reykjavik, Iceland, and the tickets had gone on sale two minutes ago. I went to the website and acquired two front row tickets. I sent the screenshot to Heather. There was a long silence that followed. She was beyond stunned. Her eventual response, Jesus Coldplay Christ. <laughs> the Sigur Rós concert turned into a four-day music festival, and then I added another music festival, which I had attended the prior year in Houston. Our travel plans were set. However, Heather wasn't. I noticed an aura of unease when I was around her. She was enjoying herself, but there was a thorn stuck in her side. I suspected she was con conflicted about our relationship. Not willing to match me in my efforts, but cautiously following along. One Saturday in November, I was prepping mashed potatoes for a pre-Thanksgiving -fa pre family dinner. A dinner where I, where I would have introduced Heather to my family members. I got the email. This isn't going to work. You and I are not going to work. The wind evacuated from my lungs and I felt a punch to the gut. I tried in two subsequent emails and a visit to understand what had happened. But after hugging her one last time, I left her alone, completely alone. I stopped communicating altogether. I took my daughter to Houston and I braced and went to Reykjavik alone. Both excursions were amazing and life-affirming. Later, a concert had been planned for January 10th. This was a band called Typhoon, one Heather had recommended to me. I still had tickets from the time we were together and a, birth, a booth reserved. Coinciding with this, I read a book review titled Anesthesia about the history and effects of the same. Knowing Heather was writing a book about her own experience involving, involving anesthesia, I ordered a copy for her. It arrived at her house that day. I received a text message. Did you send me a book? Yes. Are you going to Typhoon? We. Oui. <laughs> I asked Jolene to accompany me as my wingwoman. 
As we pulled into the venue, I immediately saw Heather chatting with people across the way. Jolene and I sat down and the show started. At some point, she pulled Heather aside and, and informed her that no, I hadn't gone to Iceland with somebody else. I had gone alone. Heather had to leave early because Ivy wasn't feeling well. And as I watched them leave the concert, Heather looked at me standing against the wall in the booth. I waved and figured that was it. Ten minutes later, I turned to find Heather down on the floor staring back up at me, just gazing. Something had happened. Maybe Ivy was injured. I jumped from where I was standing over a table, over the bottles, over Jolene, and landed in front of Heather. I couldn't leave without saying something to you. I put my arms around her and embraced her. I, told her and to I, I held her and told her it would be okay. Then I went to check out on Ivy. Their Uber had arrived and Ivy was confused. What is going on? Where is Heather? Never you mind, I said, and I helped her inside the car. I returned to Heather, watched the concert end with her, and took her home. The next day was my birthday. We spent the next three months keeping our renewed re relationship a secret. It was glorious. As summer neared, Heather's planned solo trip to Paris became our trip. I made reservations at restaurants and for guided excursions. When we arrived, the cafes were showing World Cup games. France would win a match, then another match. We both wondered what al aloud what would happen if France went all the way and won the World Cup. We were sitting on the banks of the Seine with a thousand other people when France did. The city erupted and we walked in the crowd, shoulder to shoulder, to the Arc de Triomphe. I had reservations at Jules Verne, the restaurant in the Eiffel Tower, that evening. They were canceled due to the celebrations and moved to the next day. When we arrived for dinner, we were the only couple who bothered to dress up. They seated us at the best table in the house overlooking the Champs de Lycée. As we settled into dinner, three fighter jets flew by our window, streaming red, white, and blue smoke. This was the kind of magic that pervaded our time together. We both so, felt so lucky to be alive and with a person who loved us so much. We traveled to France, England, Italy, Amsterdam, Denmark, Portugal, Prague, and around the US and Canada on the book tour and on our own. We had a note we shared where he jotted down future locations of travel. We took two trips in 2023. The first was when Lita returned home for spring break. I made reservations at the homestead in Midway. Our last night, we went to the nearby crater and swam in its warm, deep, dark waters. I floated with Heather face to face with my arms around her as I paddled my legs and navigated from one corner to another. Our last trip together was to Goblin Valley on a three-day weekend with Marlow, the only trip we took in the newly purchased motorhome. We hiked, we climbed, we played Scrabble, and on Sunday night, <laughs> after watching Galaxy Quest on my laptop, the overcast sky parted, and the universe came pouring in. Marlowe and Heather lay on the ground next to each other and remarked that they had never seen anything like it. I told them we could come back any time. Heather and I had a love language that we spoke to each other, and it was music. I felt so lucky to be with a woman who had the same ears 
that I had. In that tour, when I went to Reykjavik alone, I was introduced to a band, which ironically was probably their last concert ever, called Stars of the Lid. And for those of you who are unfamiliar, it's a string trio, two guys on guitars, and a Moog synthesizer played at jet engine levels. And as I watched that band, I thought of Heather, and they, they tore my soul out through my tear ducts. I thought if there's ever a chance for Heather to see this, if I ever see Heather again, I want her to see something like this. Many months later, I found out that they had a sister band. One of the members was still producing music under a name, A Winged Victory for the Sullen. There was one night when Heather and I were fighting and I put on Winged Victory for the Sullen and she came to me and she said, you have no right to play this music that has changed my life. <laughs> but we shared that. And we saw them on their last tour in London, England. We both left late February of 2020. And John was nice enough to come and watch the house and watch the girls and watch the dog. I guess there was no dog at that point. No, no, sorry. <laughs> But he came and watched, and we had a transcendory time in London. It was a beautiful concert. And later, well, we came home, Heather and I, with COVID. You're welcome. <laughs> we were probably the first people to come into the state with COVID. Um, but that band, one night, Heather and I were sitting talking in bed, and the subject of our funerals came up. And we asked each other what we wanted to hear at our funerals. And that was it for both of us. So I'm going to play a little slideshow, and I have to thank Jessica Wiseman for putting it to the music. She's here tonight. Um, these are intimate pictures that I took of Heather that weren't professionally done. And there are two tracks by a winged victory for the sullen. At Atomos 6 and Atomos 7. Can we kill the lights?
How lucky am I? Henry, Heather loved you. We loved the things you said at dinner. We would talk about them when we went to bed. Do you remember saying, what's the difference between appropriation and inspiration? That's how deep and wide you are. And he Heather knew it. Oscar, Heather loved you. She loved record shopping with you. She loved clothes shopping with you. She loved your style and your creativity and your verve and your lust for life. And she only wanted the best for you. Lita, Heather loved you. She is so proud of you and, what, and the woman you are becoming and your talents and your dedication and your wit and your smarts. And Marlo, she loved you. Every time you look at those stars, I want you to think about your mom because that's where she's at. And she's looking right back at you. I'm gonna miss you too. I'm gonna miss the times around the dinner table that we all had. I'm even gonna miss COVID, the earthquake, the death of Coco, and the rise of Bergy. And Bergy's always gonna be there for you. And you always have a home in Utah. And John, I know the waters can get bloodied in a divorce, but I know you're a good man, and even more important, you're a good dad. I'm privileged and proud to have helped taken care of your girls over the last five years, and I'm gonna miss them. Heather, did a deep dive in philosophy and religion. And she was the one who informed me of the, not the, the Stoics and Marcus Aurelius. And just the other day, I found her copy of Meditations by Marcus Aurelius. And it had several bookmarks in it. And I'm going to go through and read that. She also talked about Alan Watts. And I talked with her about Terence McKenna and what existence meant and why we were here. She also loved Stephen Hawking and Brian Cox. And we talked about black holes endlessly and the nature of the universe and what it all meant. In this last few weeks, there was a moment where I was struggling with the idea of Heather floating around me. And I asked my friend Dan, what do you think of all that? And out of the blue, he said, well, have you read the Gnostics? And I hadn't. And I went and read the Wikipedia page in bed that night. And George, it was like, here you go, MFR. <laughs> just the way Heather would do it. She pointed me to that. And it's a stunning story, it's a stunning religion. But what the most important thing I found about that was, is they believe we all come from love and light. And everything we do to cover that light, hide your light under a bushel, hide the light of Christ, Every religion talks about the light, but everything that we do to cover up that light is a sin. It's not a list of things that we're not supposed to do. It's the fact that we are love and light, and we cover it up. And I got to tell you, there were times with Heather that I covered up my light when she was completely covered. And it was hard, and I regret it. So I'm telling you one message tonight to go forward and uncover your lights and uncover the lights of the people you love and we'll all be better for it. 
There's a poem by Aeschylus. Even in our sleep, pain which cannot forget falls drop by drop upon the heart until in our own despair, against our will, comes wisdom through the awful grace of God. Heather, I love you. Heather, I forgive you. And Heather, I will always love you. Thank you. So be.